Well, aloha and welcome today to Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kei'i Akina and I welcome you to our little study today. I've got some guests and you're going to enjoy meeting them. I have David Swan, who is the cartoonist for the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii and Joe Kent, the executive vice president. We're going to talk a little bit about taking complex ideas and making them easy to understand and actually fun to understand. How to think better by using cartoons. That's something that's a a skill that has been learned by some of the great cartoonists. And you may have seen some of the work of David Swan in his mainland publications or in the Honolulu Star Advertiser. There was a series called Trouble in Paradise that he did for many years, and he worked for the Star Ad as well. Today he works for the Grassroot Institute, and I'd like to welcome him to the program. Welcome, David. Good to have you on board. Thanks for having me for the show. Well, you do great work, and it's just a delight to chat with you a little bit about it. I also want to welcome Joe Kent, our vice president. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a lot of times, Joe and I oh, pull our head hair out. <laughs> we <laughs> yeah, try to take complex ideas and reduce them to the size of a bumper sticker, which is a lot of hard work. I, what is harder, coming up with the ideas or coming up with how to communicate those ideas? Oh, uh, communicating them, absolutely. Because, um, you know, we're basically a bunch of nerds in an office, and we're trying to relate to regular people, and that can be a challenging sometimes. So. That's why we are glad to have artists like David. Mm -hmm. David, how long have you been drawing? Uh, I started, or when did you start drawing? <laughs> I started drawing when I was uh, a couple years old. A couple years old? I don't know if I could hold a pen when I was a couple <laughs> years old. I mean, I could use my hands and go like this with my mush. Yeah, well, this was a million years before the internet, so we had things, pens and pencils to entertain ourselves. And Anyway, when I was a, a kid, I used to just sit in the corner and draw, and I was happy to do that. And when I got into high school, I wanted to be, I, I kind of, I did cartoons for the uh, high school newspaper. Didn't really know what I wanted to do after that, joined the Air Force, and uh, then I uh, decided I thought I'd, I'd like to be an editorial cartoonist or either a comic strip artist. So what caused you to become a cartoonist? Um, bad genetics? Uh, no. Uh, no, I, uh, I don't know. I think it's an eight. You know, I just, some people can draw uh, some uh, things that they see easily. I was never very good at actual fine art. I, I, could, I could do the cartoons easily because it was, you know, cartoons are kind of the lowest form. And so it, was, it wasn't that much of a stretch to do. And, and I was a, a, a keen student of uh, Mad Magazine as I was growing up. Late 60s, early 70s, Mad Magazine was sort of like the only satire out there. I mean, there weren't really any, there wasn't anything on television. There weren't really that many magazines out there that it made fun of people, you know. And, and I thought that was really pretty cool when I would read uh, Mad and, you know, Alfred E. Newman and all that stuff. And it, it uh, kind of stuck with me, so. That's well, that, that's something. You know, we appreciate the way you're using that to help Grassroot Institute publicize ideas. Joe? You work really hard on our ideas in terms of individual liberty and free markets and limited accountable government, all kinds of issues ranging from the cost of the rail system to whether the government has enough money in the accounts that are covering our pensions for public workers and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, how has using cartoons helped to convey uh, these ideas and get oh, them yeah. across? Well, it's definitely been a game changer. I mean. Um, to have someone sit down and read a full 20-page study about the employee retirement system or the employer union trust fund and the billions of dollars and unfunded liabilities that we have is, um, you know, very difficult. But when you can just have someone glance at a cartoon that encamp, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So, um, and, and that really helps a lot and convey the ideas. And people share them and like them on Facebook and. Um, spread it around so it, it reaches a lot more people than our 20-page you know, studies. Now, David, sometimes, you, although the whole team comes together to work on putting the ideas into your cartoons, you're the point of the spear. And, and in your career, I'm sure you've received praise from some people and otherwise from others. Uh, uh, can you recall any moments, uh, any instances in which you've been attacked for your cartoons? Uh, yeah, when I was a, I was a cartoonist, an outdoor cartoonist in Alabama for my first uh, eight or nine years of my career, and uh, a medium-sized newspaper, the Huntsville Times in Huntsville, Alabama, and um, I knew I'd arrived when I started, uh, you know, getting hate mail that they would, you know, print in the paper. You know, it's not, it wasn't like it is now where you can, uh, someone can 
send an instant text and, and, and be mad about something. Back then, the big thing was to read the letters to the editor. And um, it, was an e it was easy pickings back then. It was a lot of fun because it was during the Reagan era. And, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was pretty easily, easy to draw. And um, the 80s were just, you know, pi fighter pilots would call it a target-rich environment because it was always very easy to, to um, par parody or satirize so much of what was going on around me. Of course, it's nothing compared to today. I mean, it's back, you look back to those times and you, you think, wow, how quaint. But, um, yeah, so uh, my, my career started in the 80s, and... Um, I remember one time I was on the radio in the late 80s. Somebody had me on the radio, and um, I didn't really have that much of a stance on the Palestinian uh, issue, but it was a pretty big deal back then, and um, I had drawn probably a pretty insensitive cartoon at the time. I mean, I was pretty young, and I didn't really know better, but I can't quite remember the, um, the, the cartoon itself, the specific cartoon, but I remember I came into the radio station, and the host had brought in several people from Palestine, and, and he hadn't told me that when I was coming on. It was sort of an ambush, and I was, I was kind of, you know, wide-eyed. But uh, that was one time I can remember I was sort of uh, sweating a little bit. <laughs> wow, it could be a dangerous life, possibly. Yeah. You know, Joe, one of the things that we do at Grassroot is try to determine where Hawaii is with respect to the rest of the nation. And that's valuable because it helps us to see where we have to improve, and in some cases, where we're actually leading the country and where we could grow further. And one of those areas has to deal with taxes. Mm -hmm. So frequently in your work, you're surveying other, nation, other um, states, <laughs> finding out exactly what their tax policy is. And one of the things that we discovered is that when it comes to inheritance taxes, debt taxes, so to speak, Hawaii is very expensive. In fact, uh, we've learned that we're really amongst the worst states in terms of such a tax. That's right. We're uh, rated the, the worst in the nation in 50 out of 50 on the estate tax, um, although tied with some other states. And uh, this year, we got even worse. I mean, the uh, estate tax, they, they hiked the estate tax at the state legislature to about 20 percent for certain groups. And, um, and so that's going to be a lot of money taken from folks who are passing their um, property, um, their inheritance, I guess. And uh, that's going to have an effect on our economy and also the people that decide to live here. That's well. right. In fact, you know, we've had the brain drain of the, of the young going away to college for college opportunities and for jobs after that. But now we have the, the, the age drain, so mm. to speak, people who are in retirement who are leaving, who had never imagined that they would leave, but they're leaving for a variety of reasons. One of them is the cost of inheritance taxes. Mm. In fact, when it came time for us to try to convey that to the public, you turned to David. So I want to throw up a, a cartoon, Dave, for you to explain. Let, let's put the first one up, uh, uh, something David came up with to express this idea. What, talk us through this. Well, um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I'd like to uh, give credit where credit is due. Uh, the, the people around me, uh, Jacqueline Young and, and Joe Kent, uh, Joshua Mason, Mark Coleman, they, uh, they're really good about coming up with a basic idea, the idea that they, they want that to be addressed that week. Um, and they give me the, a certain amount of leeway as to exactly how to convey it, how to illustrate it. So um, whenever you do, whenever you draw an editorial cartoon, um, you know, there's a million different ways you can approach it. Um, I, I always like to think of immediacy. Uh, you know, I, I, there's some cartoons that you can look at and you can, you can, it takes you a little bit to, a little bit of time to understand it, but when you, when I, when I'm trying to be more immediate, and I thought the most immediate way to approach this was just to have a man saying, at least they can't tax me when I die, and then someone saying, well, actually, and just trail off, and then you can read the, the, the headline, which the man's holding, the second man's holding the newspaper saying, Hawaii raises death tax. So you actually kind of get people to think. That's what the trailing off is. Well, actually, right. they can tax me after I die. Right. So the punchline is the headline of the newspaper. And you kind of always want to, you want to make sure that's first and foremost with people and you don't want to lose it. And when I first started, it took me a while to understand that, that, that you had to, there's a certain cadence or a, or a, a rhythm a, a rhythm or a pacing 
That's right. Because when you think, you know, you have to picture yourself as the reader. They don't know anything. They're not inside your head. It's not just a sign that says taxes are bad. Right, yeah. It, you're trying to create some cognitive activity in the process. Right. You're trying to create some anticipation. Yes. Well, that's very interesting. Well, there's another issue in which we asked you to help us out, and that is the fact that uh, as we look across the country, there are numerous transportation boondoggles. You've got the big dig up in Boston. You've got the uh, Alaska Road to, Bridge to Nowhere. You've got the California transportation system, which the federal government has now defunded. And of course, we've got the Honolulu Area Rapid Transit, the heart and the, the ongoing saga of a program that was supposed to be, what, $2.5 billion to start off with, yeah. Joe, and then it's going to be well over $10 billion when it's finished, and we're not even halfway through, and it has become the most expensive per capita transportation project on planet Earth. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, right, yeah. And so my job that I assigned you, Joe, was help people get it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's right, and, and a lot of people um, say, okay, that's a lot of money, $10 billion or $9 billion, whatever it is. Um, but then there's another question that a lot of people ask is, well, what about after the rail's built? And who's going to operate the rail as it goes on? And who's going to pay for that? So that's one thing that we were saying, hmm, maybe we can make a cartoon about this. Well, so let's throw the next one up, Dave. Talk us through this, what you came up with. Okay, so uh, the second one here, about the uh, about the rail um, again, you know, immediacy. You, you want to be able to get the message across as quickly as possible. So you have the man on the left, almost like your first kind of like uh, fall guy from the first cartoon, saying, "Where will the money come from to operate and maintain the rail?" Pretty direct. And then um, your politician, who's in the red shirt to the right, just no worries, bro. Don't worry about it. And you know, behind him comes this tsunami of tax increases. And again, it was a you know. I have to say, you know, Joe and, and his crew come up with some really good ideas, and they let, they give me some leeway as to how to actually illustrate it. And so it works out pretty well. Well, that's very good. You know, sometimes we want to convey that there are certain ideas that are utterly ludicrous. And so it helps to compare them uh, to, well, let's talk, for example, about some of the legislation that has been proposed recently for people who rent out a bedroom, either through Airbnb or just as a vacation rental and so forth. Uh, naturally, we have to balance the needs of the community with the rights of the individual to their property and the right to make a little bit of additional money. But uh, our legislators and our city council people have come up with proposals to really penalize people. Uh, and Joe, what are some of those penalties that have been sure. proposed? Well, there was a... Uh, um, bill that was passed at the Honolulu Council to basically ban the um, uh, Airbnb or vacation rental the practice of um, renting your home out and sharing it with a visitor. And um, the bill basically fines these people um, thousands of dollars per day, sometimes $10,000, sometimes uh, $5,000 per day. And we've seen on and other And it can really add up. Yeah, we've seen on some counties where it actually racks up to millions of dollars for some people. And um, so, you know, we're always asking, well, how far is too far when it comes to this? Well, let's see what David came up with. We've got about a minute left. Let's take a look. Yeah, so just real quick, uh, the two guys in the jail, uh, <laughs> OCCC, he's just, you know, you got a scruffy-looking guy saying he's in for robbing a bank. How about you? And the poor guy on the right just says, I shared my home with a guest. And I think that, that says it all right there <laughs> in that one moment. What we've done is we've taken something which is a minor infraction and elevated it into a major felony offense. And uh, that's the ludicrousy of what happens in public policy sometimes. Well, Dave, we're going to take a quick break and come back and take a look at a few more cartoons. My guest today is David Swan, who is the cartoonist for the Grassroot Institute and our executive vice president who handles our policy work, Joe Kent. Don't go away. We'll be right back on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel? Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you 
at the crossroads. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program airs every other Monday at 1 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel, who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about. Human stories about law and life. Aloha. Well, thanks for not going away. I'm Kili'i Akina, back with you, and David Swan, our cartoonist at the Grassroot Institute, and Joe Kent. And one of the things that we're going to pick up on is the fact that the kind of humor that really changes minds doesn't always have to attack individuals. I think that when you see a lot of the political drama that takes place in campaigns as well as between campaigns as political figures comment upon each other's work, there is a great deal of attack upon individuals. There, one of the natural things to do for cartoonists is to make fun of individuals not only for their policies, but also for their facial features, such as their noses or their <laughs> hair, their eyes, the way they walk and the way they talk and so forth. But uh, Joe, as we were talking about our editorial policy at Grassroot, we felt that that may not be the most productive way to reach out to people and generate sympathy for ideas. <laughs> That's right. We, we generally don't like to focus on attacking people. We would rather look at ideas and let's talk about ideas. And Sometimes that can be difficult to convey in a cartoon format, but Dave does a great job. Oh, well, thanks. I was, uh, I was just thinking about um, the difference between working for Grassroot and working at a daily newspaper doing editorial cartoons, and that probably is the main difference in the cartoons of the content is, is that, you know, we were, uh, which is this sort of in fashion now, uh, sort of personality assassination. and. You know, I never have meant anything to be truly malicious. I always thought, well, it's all in fun. But one time, a few years ago, it kind of came home to me when uh, the editorial page editor at the Star Advertiser told me that she was talking to a, a woman who worked for HECO, and this is back when they were being beat up in the news a lot about the solar uh, panel is issue. And uh, she said the woman was almost in tears when she told her that she had seen one of my cartoons and I had... I had portrayed Hecko as, as this devil, like a, like a little devil with a pitchfork and the horns. And, you know, I had no idea at the time when I drew that 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 could possibly hurt anyone's feelings. But you know, I thought, oh, it's a joke. It's a cartoon devil. But then I made me start thinking, wow, you know, pe some people actually do take some of this to heart. And so it's, it's nice to see that the Grassroot Institute doesn't go that route. Not that there's, I mean, anything wrong. I mean, if nowadays, unfortunately, the way people are, is, it seems like the loudest person screaming gets the most attention. But it's a, it, I think it's an effective way for you guys to get across the ideas. And every time Joe uh, sends over an idea, uh, I've always noticed that it's not about a person. It's about an idea or a concept. Well, that's what we want to talk about. We want to raise the awareness of ideas and help people to understand them, to talk about them and to choose the best ideas regardless of party line, personality, ethnicity, religion, and so forth. And so, as you notice, we're not attacking people for those qualities and so forth. We're actually trying to illustrate an idea. For example, one of the most complex ideas to illustrate is the fact that government does some things well and should do certain things, but it does other things very, very badly <laughs> for a whole host of reasons. I mean. Complex service-oriented businesses like running and maintaining an airport. You know, that's something that the government is not particularly better than a corporation would be. And uh, in many ways, privatizing that or a good deal of it would actually bring about great improvements. That's what our research shows by looking all across the world and across the country. So, Joe, you were wrestling with that idea with some recent legislation proposed regarding the Honolulu International Airport. That's right. I mean, if you look across the nation, um, most airports are not um, run by the government. They're run by a third party, either um, privately run or some airport authority or something like that. 
Um, what, but in Hawaii, our airport is run basically by the government, um, by the Department of Transportation. And also, we're um, one of the worst uh, looking airports, I think, in the nation. And, um, and a lot of visitors to Hawaii would agree to that. And so a lot of people were asking, well, how can we update the airport? And there's this, been this idea of an airport authority. Let's have an airport authority to help try to manage the airport like other states. do. Um, mysteriously, that, that concept keeps dying. It's been uh, you know, um, floated in bills about four years, and it's died four years in a row now. But we're keeping it alive as an idea. And David, uh, you helped us to convey exactly what the problem is with our current system. Let's pull up this next cartoon. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, I was trying to figure out a way to show the degradation or the rundown state of the airport uh, in a cartoon. And when, you, when I started to actually draw the cartoon, I realized it wasn't really that easy. I had to, I had to uh, focus on a couple of small things, like a, a zooming in on people just walking down on, you know, a hallway with holes punched in the, in the wall and leaking um, uh, water fountains. I always notice when I go through the airport, I'm looking for water, and, and it seems like half of them are covered up with, you know, garbage bags or something. And so the idea there is, is that, you know, um, Someone's saying the obvious, which something should be done, and then right below that, the headline is, is that, you know, the, the state rejects new airport authority for the fourth time in a row, which, again, the punchline is, and if you're reading left to right like we do in the West for the most part, the punchline is at the bottom right of the page, and so you kind of direct the, the reader's eye to read up left first and then go down to the punchline on the newspaper. And, so yeah, that's that, that another another great idea uh, that was given to me by the grassroots crew. Well, very effective bringing people into a sense of really what's wrong at the airport, and packing a lot of information in there, ending up with the punchline that our state is basically continuing to decline to use the most reasonable option for solving the problem. Sometimes cartoons also allow us to lift our thinking above the local problem that we deal with to lofty ideals and values that our nation was founded upon. And one issue in which I think we've asked you to help us out with is that of civil asset forfeiture. That's a technical term, civil asset forfeiture, for giving police and government the power to take property, and in the case of Hawaii, to take people's property even before they've been convicted of a felony and then not give it back unless they get a lawyer to petition it through a lengthy process and so mm -hmm. forth. And as a result, uh, we noticed that we were recently ranked as one of the bottom states in the nation with a grade of a D minus for our civil asset forfeiture laws. Our legislature had a proposal to attempt to change that, but that failed this past term. Actually, it passed. Oh, it, okay. It were, passed. Sorry, thanks for correcting me. Go ahead and give <laughs> and the... the uh, and so the, the, actually, the legislature passed the uh, bill that would have corrected the civil asset forfeiture uh, practice and, um, and basically required police to have a felony or to, to give a felony conviction before taking people's stuff. And, uh, and that bill, though, unfortunately, was vetoed by Governor Ige. Uh, yes, that's recently. what I was referring to. The, the law itself... Mm -hmm. would, did not pass. Right. But how do we bring the situation to the, the public eye? How do we talk about it? Let's look at the next cartoon. Dave, you've helped us out here. And this one was um, done on July 4th, I believe. So yes. <laughs> we wanted to relate that. Right. Um, so again, you know, th this one was, you always look for one that you can do really simply without even, uh, you know, a, a thought balloon or, a, or any type of uh, someone saying something. And this one was, it was, it was uh, given to me, okay, how do we show the, the torch being taken from the Statue of Liberty uh, by the police under the civil asset forfeiture laws? And so this was one of the simpler ones, which was, you know, it was a pretty straightforward cartoon. It's just a matter of, I think, I think the biggest difficulty I had is how do I get that, all that hype, sort of civil asset forfeiture onto the crane, because cranes aren't usually that large. <laughs> so I just had to fatten it up. Yeah, that and that's, great. The, that's the nice thing about cartooning, is you can just... You can change you, the you proportion. Can, yes. But what I really like about this is it takes a, a problem that is often seen at the smallest level, someone losing their home or losing their car at the local level, and talks about it in terms of the grand idea of liberty, to have the Statue of Liberty 
forfeiting her tort. I mean, that says it all there. That's how profound this cartoon helps us understand this issue. And another good thing about that cartoon, by the way, is that it's, it um, doesn't have a lot of text and everything. It's just visual. You right. just take one glance at it, and you know what it is. Well, another situation that we were talking about in our policy meeting is the fact that uh, in Honolulu County, and this is true to some extent in the other counties as well, but in Honolulu County in particular, we have a problem with the trash collection in terms of the costs involved and now the complexity in being able to get through some of the political maneuvering there. Joe, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, basically the um, trash pickup in Honolulu is um, done. People dump their trash and the city picks it up. But there has been um, you know, some complaining about um, how much this costs the city. And so they tried to hike you know, a tax fee and um, basically saying that we need more money to do this. Um, that was shot down. And so now they're, they're have, they have a pilot program to basically not pick up the trash unless somebody asks. And what's resulting is people aren't asking and the trash is picking, piling up um, across Honolulu. And so a lot of people are saying, well, you know, what's going on with my tax money? I think I thought I was paying tax money, my property tax money, to have you guys pick this up. Well, this is our last cartoon now. So David, would you walk us through this a little bit? Yeah, so one of the challenges on this one was uh, we needed to get a lot into a, a small uh, little rectangle. So, um, so the idea is, you know, uh, the, the, the politicians saying, well, we can't afford to pick up the trash. And so you, you kind of have to cram the trash bags in around him with the flies and everything behind him. And uh, then your Hawaii resident asking, you know, obviously, almost rhetorically, so where is my, where is my tax money going? Um, and then we have the, the money, piles of money crammed up under the, one of the, uh, the rail um, structures there that's unfinished. And, you know, it kind of got into a separate issue with the rail, but, it, but I, think, I, think that, I think we were able to get it all in. I think so. And it, it helped people get the bigger picture that if money's not going to meet the needs that we have that are immediate, where is that money going? It's obviously coming from the taxpayers, but... We're not seeing it produce the results we need. Dave, it's been wonderful having you on the show today. Well, thanks for and having me. And Joe, thanks for joining us as Thank well. You. This has been great. And uh, let me just tell the audience that if you want to see more of these cartoons, we have a weekly release of the cartoon. Just go to our website and sign up at www.grassrootinstitute.org. That's grassroot, not with an S. It's grassrootinstitute.org. And you can just sign up and get these cartoons sent to you every single week. We're going to close with one in the background. And uh, that's the final cartoon here as I'm talking. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this, and I hope you'll be back and see more of us on Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next time, aloha.